Welcome to the Building Science for Dry Climates video series with Franklin Energy. This series was developed to assist contractors in the Comfortable Home Rebate Program and inform the way they approach the scope of work for their customers. The series builds upon decades of research from experts across the country and brings together key concepts that we believe will help you help your customers realize greater energy savings by looking at the house as a system and applying these basic building science strategies to your home improvement solutions. The video series brings together the key components of a comprehensive building science training and will demonstrate why each of these is a critical element in the residential energy retrofit industry. The sequencing of the videos are not in an order from most to least important. Rather, they're simply ordered in a way that we think best layers the information that highlights the interconnectedness of the topics and why it's so important to examine all of these elements at every job. Together, these topics combine for more than just improved energy efficiency. They also provide for the health, safety, and durability of the home long after your project is completed. In this first video, we will examine these four topics. Building science basics, house as a system, comfort and climate, and indoor air quality. So what is building science? Simply put, it's a pool of information that examines the physical behavior of the building as a system and how this impacts energy efficiency, durability, comfort, and indoor air quality. Let's get started with the basics. For decades, research has examined the cause and effects of building failure. And what they've found has led to these basic tenets of building science and weatherization. A comfortable, safe, and energy efficient home requires a fully insulated thermal envelope a well-sealed air barrier. Since air carries heat and moisture, the condition of the air barrier plays a major role in the movement of heat and moisture throughout the building. It also affects the size of the heating and cooling systems and indoor air quality. It's important that the thermal and air barriers are continuous and in contact with one another. Our friends at the Building Performance Institute refer to this as being in alignment. Efficient, properly sized HVAC equipment to condition the living space. A well-designed and balanced duct system to deliver that conditioned air. And finally, healthy indoor air quality. Indoor air quality is a key health and safety concern. We test for things like carbon monoxide and backdrafting and mold and moisture to make sure that we leave the homes safe for the residents. Let's get started with heat transfer. There are three types of heat transfer. Conduction, which is heat transfer through touch. Convection, like the movement of gas or liquid. And for this conversation, we'll be talking about air leakage as the heat loss or heat gain associated with air leakage. And radiation, which is the transfer of heat across a space without heating the space itself. Delta T is the temperature difference. Because heat always moves from an area of hot to cold, we can predict and try to stop heat transfer. The greater the difference in temperature, the more heat and air will want to escape or enter the building. How about pressure? Pressure is an important factor that fewer people look at on a regular basis. I know that for me, in my own learning process, pressure was a lot less intuitive, and I had to teach myself how to look for and measure pressure issues when I was evaluating or assessing a home. Even this key piece goes back to things we already know, but may or may not play into our everyday decision-making processes. Air will flow from an area of high pressure to low pressure. For every CFM that enters, one CFM will exit. And flow takes the path of least resistance. Air isn't smart, 
It goes where it's easiest to flow, not where you want it to. So the part of your home that reduces the rate of heat transfer through your shell is referred to as the thermal boundary. It limits heat flow between inside and out. It's easy to identify by the presence of insulation. The location of insulation in relation to other building components is critical. And even small areas of missing insulation can be you know, quite important because voids as small as 4% can reduce the effective R value of R19 by up to 30%. The part of your home that minimizes uncontrollable air leakage through the building is called the air barrier. Air barriers limit airflow between inside and out. It's a little bit more difficult to identify. It's not always where you think it is. For example, even in this picture, you can see this magic red and yellow line that surround this conditioned space. But we know that when you transition from, say, a floor assembly to a wall assembly, you, we don't have that perfect line. Same thing with wall to attic assembly. So knowing how to assess um, the location and condition of a continuous air barrier with a continu continuous thermal boundary, it's important. And we can use a tool called a blower door to, to really assess the condition of the air barrier. In order for air leakage to occur though, there has to be a hole and there has to be a pressure across that hole or a pressure difference across that hole. The bigger the hole or the greater the difference in pressure, the more air leakage will occur. Air leakage occurs in two ways, through direct leakage or indirect leakage. Direct leakage occurs at direct openings to outdoors where the leakage enters and exits at the same location, like through a doggy door or around a leaky window. Older recess light cans that have the big vents in them that let out the heat are another example. Indirect leakage happens when the leakage enters at one location but moves through building cavities and exits at a different location like through a top plate penetration for an electrical or plumbing service, uh, or sometimes through uh, floor assemblies. But when we talk about air leakage, it is important to differentiate between air leakage and ventilation. Infiltration and exfiltration are terms used to describe the uncontrollable amount of air leaking in or out through the shell of a home. Ventilation, on the other hand, is used to describe the controlled amount of mechanically moved air and is most commonly used in controlled locations like kitchens, bathrooms, and laundry rooms. With air leakage, it's important to remember these simple truths. Airflow takes the path of least resistance. It moves from areas of high pressure to lower pressure, it also moves from areas of high temperature to low temperature. And the bigger the pressure or temperature differences, the greater the movement of air. Airflow is measured in cubic feet per minute, can be written as the foot cubed or more commonly the acronym CFM. So where does the pressure come from? Pressure difference Pressure differences drive air leakage, but what causes the pressure difference? The driving forces that induce temperature or pressure differences are wind, heat, referred to as a stack effect, and fans, mostly exhaust fans and duct leads. Wind will create a positive pressure on the windward side of a home that can drive infiltration on that side of the building can also cause a depressurization or an area of negative pressure on the downwind side that can drive exfiltration or air being pulled from inside to outside of the home. The stack effect is caused by the natural buoyancy of warmer air rising to the top of a building, creating a slight positive pressure at the top and a negative pressure in the lower levels. This pressure drives exfiltration of conditioned air out of the tops of our homes, 
and invites infiltration of outside air, as you can see illustrated by the arrows. This is the best photo I've ever seen to illustrate stack effect. And it's commonly used in building science courses. You can clearly see the high pressure at the top and the negative pressure at the lower floors pushing on that piece of plastic. As building scientists, we've created our own tools to find and measure air leakage. The blower door is one of those tools. The blower door can be a controlled driving force that depressurizes a house, drawing air through all the holes. This exaggerated depressurization can be used to help us find leaks in the building envelope. We also see forces created by combustion appliances. Combustion appliances that take their combustion air from inside a home, like most 80% furnaces and conventional gas water heaters can create a negative pressure in the home. Exhaust fans can also create negative pressure. They push our inside air out and create a negative pressure. Duct leakage can create significant pressures, both positive and negative, in different areas of our home. The pressure associated with duct leakage can be larger and more important because the driving force is stronger. In the situation that you see here, when the door between the bedroom and the main body closes, what do you think might just happen? You guessed it. The closed doors prevent supply air from getting back to the return and cause positive pressure in those rooms with supply vents. Meanwhile, starving the return air causes negative pressure in the zone where the return is located. So if you look at this dynamic across the whole house, it's easy to predict pressure imbalances based on the locations of return and supply events throughout a home. What you start to see is all of the parts of the building that are associated with being open back to the main return in the hallway are showing a negative depressurization while each of the individual rooms that has the option for door closure go positive. What are some methods for balancing the pressures in this house? Well, I've got three. You know, it's pretty common to undercut the bottom of the doors. Um, you could add a return in maybe the master bedroom or adding some kind of a transfer grill over a door or even a jump duct from bedroom back to hallway in the ceiling. Those are just some ideas that I've seen you know, to help kind of minimize this effect. To summarize these building science fundamentals, homes have both a thermal boundary in the insulation, as well as a pressure boundary or air barrier. Most commonly, it's the sheetrock. And it's important to assess the condition of both and identify opportunities for improvement. Together, they create the envelope around a home's conditioned space, and they work best when they are continuous and in contact with each other. Holes in the air barrier, combined with the pressure difference, allow the opportunity for air leakage in a building, which can have enormous impact on energy consumption and other negative ramifications associated with moisture and indoor air quality. Wind, stack effect, and fans are the three biggest drivers creating the pressure that determine the amount of air leakage that buildings will be experiencing. We introduced the blower door as a tool that we can use to locate holes in the air barrier and quantify the home leakage. We'll cover the blower door in much more detail in later videos, but we can use it to create pressures for the sake of improving the overall energy efficiency of a home. Lastly, we introduce the importance of the duct system and how duct location and condition combined with door closures can create significant pressures in various parts of the house, which in turn would drive air leakage through the shell.
either as exfiltration of conditioned air in a pressurized room or as infiltration of unconditioned air in a depressurized part of the main body. Now let's look at the next topic, the house as a system. When you look at a house as a system of interdependent parts, you begin to see how much they can affect each other. It's unfortunate in the trades that we're basically taught to go as fast as we can and to focus on our own specialty, meaning Carpenters aren't thinking about the insulators. The plumbers aren't thinking about the sheet rockers. But a building performance contractor bucks that trend and looks at each house with a wider lens and looks for deficiencies in other parts. When the parts work together, the house is more comfortable, safe, and efficient. When they don't, you start to get problems. Some are obvious, some are not. Some are immediate and others take years. But what parts of the house are we going to look at? Let us focus on these five systems. The condition of the thermal envelope and the air barrier are going to have huge impact on the runtime and sizing of an HVAC system. Changing out old incandescent lighting can lower the base load energy consumption of a home. Other appliances like refrigerators, pool pumps, water heaters, they also play a big role in the overall energy use of a home. This video series is going to focus mostly on how to maximize the effectiveness of the air barrier, thermal envelope, and mechanical systems. So when you run across you know, a situation like the picture on the left, you see these grossly under-insulated attics, you know that it's going to create longer runtime uh, for the mechanical equipment and you run across one of these old units it's a perfect opportunity to combine an air sealing and insulation component in the scope of work while you upgrade the efficiency and even look at downsizing the size of the equipment because you fixed a big part of the thermal problem with the insulation and can likely look to downsize equipment What if you drive up on a house and you see you notice a condition like what you see on the picture on the right? You know, I live in the Central Valley here in California. We don't get a lot of snow, but this is a very dramatic example of a perfect image of where you see heat loss coming up through the attic, you know, from holes in the ceiling. And you might get up there and find out it was something like a, a series of old recessed light cans where the Heat's literally just pouring up out of the holes to keep the old lights from overheating. Dramatic example of other kinds of key indicators you might run across. If you run across a condition like this where maybe uh, somebody at one time had run the bathroom exhaust fan just up into the attic, but never actually all the way out <laughs> through the soffit, you begin to see all that hot, moist air dumping into the attic and you might actually begin to see that hot, moist, humid air begin to condense on the bottom of a cold roof deck and cause problems with the moisture. So in summary, every house is a system of interdependent parts, including both mechanical and physical pieces. Building failures are always a symptom of some larger issues and weatherization changes some components but affects the entire house as a system. We hope that this video series will help you recognize larger scopes of work that have greater bang for the buck for your customers. But we also hope to increase your awareness of how to predict and avoid any unintended consequences like trapping too much moisture in the home or backdrafting combustion appliances. More on that in other parts of the series. Let's move on to the next topic. Comfort and climate. Most people tend to feel comfortable between temperatures of 68 to 85 degrees. And somewhere between 15 to 75 percent relative humidity. But other conditions can affect our comfort as well. Air movement, which speeds heat transfer. 
if, if air is moving over us, our evaporative cooling system works better, making us feel cooler even at the same temperature of still air. Mean radiant temperature affects comfort. Our body surface temperature is higher than the temperature of a surrounding surface. We will radiate heat to those regardless of the air temperature. This is why a window feels cold on a cold day, even when you're inside the house. The inverse also happens. It's why a wood stove feels so good on a cold day. Activity level. The more active we are, the warmer we will be, because metabolism plays a role. A person sitting is typically more comfortable at a higher and more humid temperature than an active person would be. And lastly, conditioning matters. What we're used to will matter on how we feel. Someone from Florida might be cold at 70 degrees, while a traveler from North Dakota sitting right next to him might think it's actually pretty warm. We grow accustomed to our climate around us, and when we change, we usually notice. While we already mentioned these four environmental factors that play into our thermal comfort, there are also personal factors, like what you're wearing and even your individual metabolism. The chart shown here illustrates the interaction between temperature and humidity. We tend to tolerate more heat when the, and the, when the humidity is lower. But as you can see, moving from left to right, as the humidity increases, our comfort zone requires lower and lower temperatures. If you've ever traveled to a hot, humid climate or destination, you know what I mean. You get off the plane and bam, it's like walking into a wall of humid heat. You know, it could take our body a few days to acclimate. And here we just see three pictures of three different places and climates with different temperatures and different humidities. Now let's look at relative humidity defined. I'm not an expert on humidity, so I have to read it right off the slide. Relative humidity is the amount of water vapor contained in a given volume of air relative to the total amount of water vapor it is capable of containing. And it's expressed as a percentage. That means 100% relative humidity, you'll get the water condensing. The air is no longer able to hold the vapor and water condenses. Like condensation on the outside of a glass of iced tea. We as humans can remain comfortable at a wide range of humidity levels, but high humidity levels make it harder to stay comfortable doing activities like work or exercise, while very low humidity can create health issues like bloody noses, scratchy throats, even lung and sinus issues. And while there are more modern gauges to measure humidity, the sling psychrometer is the tool that helps us measure humidity through measuring the difference in the temperature of two separate thermometers, where one is wrapped in a wet cloth and measures the temperature with the cooling effect of evaporation. So spinning the two thermometers gets two different measurements, the dry bulb measurement and the wet bulb measurement. You can plot these two numbers on a psychrometric chart to determine dew point temperature and relative humidity. Let's look at an example. So if you swing your sling psychrometer and you measure 80 degrees on the dry bulb and 66 degrees on a wet bulb, if you plot them on this psychrometric chart and where they intersect, you'll get a destination that can be projected out to read dew point temperature as well as the relative humidity. This chart's been used for years in the HVAC industry, but it helps us begin to predict moisture issues. The things to remember about relative humidity, warm, wet air contacting cold surfaces creates condensation almost immediately. And from a building science perspective, this can be very problematic. Like when a home has moderate to high humidity, and single pane windows, 
and the moisture condenses on the inside of the glass on a cold, cold winter day. Or in a hot, hot, humid climate where hot, humid air leaks into a wall cavity and then condenses on the back of the cooler sheetrock, trapping that moisture in a wall. Now, these are just two examples of where temperature and humidity can create serious moisture problems. In colder climates where humidity starts out low, it's also important to understand the dynamic of heating the air, which lowers the humidity even more. And lastly, just understanding the lower threshold for humidity and health uh, occurs you know, below 15%. So in understanding comforted climate, it's important to remember the following point. The air temperature movement and relative humidity affect thermal comfort. And for ideal conditions, most folks will find, you know, some element of comfort uh, between 68 and 85. So in the heating season, you know, we're looking to try to maintain at least 68 degrees uh, while trying to stay in this 20 to 40 percent relative humidity. And in a cooling season, if you can be comfortable up as high as 75 um, while trying to keep the relative humidity below 60%. Other ways to maintain comfort are to control drafts, um, trying to minimize temperature swings. Be aware of mean radiant heat transfer, like losing your heat, you know, standing next to a cold window or, um, you know, being near heat sources and letting them radiate to you. And then understanding the science behind um, the psychrometric chart, knowing that you can measure wet bulb and dry bulb temperatures and then determine dew point and relative humidity. The final topic in this video is to look at the role that indoor air quality plays in all of this. Up to now, we've been talking about saving energy by reducing air leakage in homes, the house as a system. But let's talk about common pollutants and chemicals we have in our homes and measures we can take to keep the concentration levels as low as possible. What kind of things determine indoor air quality? If you look at these pictures, you know, from top row from left to right, the first picture. We see regular household cleaners and solvents. This looks like the stuff you might see under a kitchen sink or a bathroom sink, maybe even in a pantry. How about in the second picture? See that kind of mysterious black stuff on the bottom of the roof deck? Kind of looks like mold, maybe. The other picture might looks like a unvented you know, heat source. Not something very common in these parts, but imagine the stuff coming out of this thing. In the top right picture, you know, kind of looks like my garage, and toolboxes and toys, you know, the having, you know, fuel powered equipment means you've got gasoline and things in your garage and being aware of, you know, how that air might be drawn in through the wall, through the door into your home. How about the bottom row? Looks like a maybe a vent, four inch flex vent, kind of maybe it's a bathroom vent running up to a higher level gable vent. Now this could cause problems with warm air condensing on the cold sides of that flex and condensing and running back down the tube. Middle picture shows a sump pump, something you see maybe down in a basement, I'm trying to bring to light the importance of um, you know, managing water. And the bottom right picture looks like, you know, an HVAC system maybe in a basement, uh, could be a garage. And what you see next to it looks like some buckets of paint, maybe some other types of chemicals. It looks like maybe in a bundle of roofing shingles or something there. But what do you think happens if there's any kind of cracks in the return duct right there in that vicinity. You know, you're gonna get 
not only that unconditioned air getting sucked into the return side of the plenum, they're also going to be pulling in all those contaminants and toxics that the paint is emitting too. And it's going to get essentially distributed all throughout your house. So you're not getting just the thermal penalty, but you're also getting that indoor air quality penalty from a problem like that. The pollutant action tree is actually a good tool just to kind of guide our strategies on, you know, how do we mitigate this kind of stuff. So start with the source. If you can, it's best to eliminate it. Like in that last picture, just move the paint somewhere else, seal the ductwork. You're eliminating it. If you can't actually eliminate it, you can look to try to encapsulate it. And by worst case, if nothing else, you can use fresh air ventilation strategies to dilute the effect uh, of the contaminants in, your, in that area. You can also look at the driver, or what's controlling the movement of air from where it is or where you don't want it. You can eliminate the problems associated with the pressure that are pushing the air or pulling it, or, or at least weaken the effects of the drivers moving the air. And assess the path. How's it getting in? Or, you know, like the example of the, you know, the quad sitting in the garage. You know, you could actually do a better job weather stripping the door. If the door is the path, you know, fix the air infiltration through the door. Those are just examples of how to use something like a pollutant action tree to help you mitigate and remove some of these indoor pollutants. This graph shows the relationship between humidity and some indoor air quality contaminants. I like this slide because it reminds me of other pollutant sources that I don't think about every day, like bacteria, and viruses. But it really drives home the importance for trying to keep a home's humidity between 35 and 60 percent, where these particular issues have the least impact. You can see on the bottom of the screen, it says a decrease in bar width indicates a decrease in effect. I'll give you a minute to look through these, kind of see the correlation of the humidity. So, how much air? do we need for good indoor air quality and, and how do we get it? For years, we just relied on the natural shell leakage in a home to drive the air changes per hour with fresh outside air. We let the wind and the stack effect and our fans be the drivers, but with that strategy, you also pay the energy penalty of heating or cooling all that unconditioned outside air that's leaked in and out. And you get the indoor air quality contaminants from places you didn't expect. Imagine your air coming, you know, down through your attic where you likely have, a, you know, rodent excrement in your insulation and your air is being filtered through that. That's what I mean, like by the indoor air quality penalty with shell leakage. Right? With that being said, you know, you... When in a program like this, where we are purposefully air sealing homes to save energy, it becomes critical that we know how to blend the disciplines of air sealing with proper ventilation strategies. I think you know, that this slide looks more complicated than it needs to, but it highlights that we use ASHRAE 62.2 ventilation standard to determine how much air is enough. ASHRAE 62.2 is different from its predecessors because it's based on square footage and number of occupants and it ignores natural ventilation like air leakage. It also has other considerations like operable windows and existing ex exhaust vents. You know, we've moved away from the ASHRAE 62.89 standard and the building airflow standard that it was associated with, which used to allow for shell leakage to be the ventilation strategy. Now, mechanical ventilation is the requirement. So please take a minute to try this residential energy dynamics or RED calculator. 
provided by this link. It'll take you right to the free calculator where you can simply see how easy it is that you, you, you can input the square footage of the home and the number of occupants and it spits out your ventilation rate required for that job. Um, this particular one is for uh, California, the one that's provided in this link. What makes it a little confusing is to understand which of the 62.2 standards to use. It's expected that you will check with your local jurisdiction for compliance, but that you will calculate both the 62.2 standard from 2016, which is the California Building Code, and the 62.2 standard from 2013, which is the national standard still required by the Building Performance Institute. And you will use the most stringent or higher of these two requirements. How you deploy your ventilation strategy is another decision. The California Energy Commission published a great article about these three strategies, supply only and exhaust only, or the balanced supply and exhaust strategy. They understand that a balanced supply and exhaust strategy is best, but may be cost prohibitive for your customer. And if you had to choose between a more affordable supply only strategy or exhaust only strategy, that the exhaust only strategy is the preferred method of those two. That's right. We're talking about something like your bathroom exhaust fan running continually or better yet, an inexpensive and quiet fan that can be set to run at various or given CFM flow rates and run intermittently, but still allows for enough mechanical ventilation to meet the ASHRAE 62.2 standard. Again, the Indoor Ventilation Minimum Best Practices Guide uh, written by the CEC, it's, it's worth the read. We highly recommend it. Pictured here is an air-to-air -air heat exchanger, commonly called a heat recovery ventilator or an HRV, where there is both outgoing exhaust line and an incoming supply duct bringing outside fresh air in. And in the box, on a cold day with the heater running, entering air is passed by the exiting exhaust air, scrubbing heat from it. The air doesn't mix like powder and water to make Kool-Aid. You know, the two air sources are not mixed together. Rather, the outgoing air is absorbed, or sorry, the heat in the outgoing exhaust air is absorbed in the heat exchanger and transferred to the colder incoming supply air to reduce the heating load needed to heat that cold incoming fresh air. This product is considered to be the higher end ventilation strategy but can provide excellent long-term heating and cooling savings and reduce interior pressures that drive air leakage in a home and improve indoor air quality by accessing the cleanest outside air and minimizing the amount that leaked through your building shell. To wrap things up, we see that indoor air quality is dependent on the quantity of contaminant sources and the concentration levels emitted by those sources. And the best strategy is to eliminate the source altogether, or at least confine it and a last resort to dilute it with fresh air ventilation. Next is to remember that all homes have contaminants, some more than others. Occupant safety and health uh, is likely had been helped by the house being leaky. So if you go and seal it up, you will likely reduce the amount of natural house ventilation that has been occurring, leading to larger concentrations of those existing sources building up inside. So understanding and deploying appropriate mechanical ventilation strategies is critical for air sealing jobs. Having access to both of the ASHRAE 62.2 standards is easier than you think. And taking the time to quickly run both the BPI required standard from 2013, as well as the standard required in your local jurisdiction and installing the higher of those two standards. Your local inspectors won't ding you for installing a fan that provides 80 CFM 
if your local code requires 72. It's okay to put in a little more. These are minimum ventilation standards. And like many things in this video series, quality installation and proper controls are critical to the success of a mechanical ventilation system. We'll go into a much deeper explanation of mechanical ventilation in a later video in this series. Thank you, and be sure to watch the rest of the Building Science videos. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to our team here at Franklin Energy.